Hello, I'm Alex Mosed, and you're here on Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. And we're just trying to figure out where this whole dust is going to settle. Uh, so t- today, let's jump on into it. We're going to uh, we're going to kind of look at some show throwbacks and do some uh, comparisons. So the first thing we have here is we had someone comment on our uh, what is a platform business model video? Eugene uh, he said he loved the book. Thanks, Eugene. Appreciate that. And question: I have been trying to Google what you think about uh, what you think about Reddit. Uh, is it a platform by your definition? Would love some more information on that. So the interesting thing about Reddit is uh, they were initially acquired by Condé Nast. Uh, maybe in 2006, is that right? I'm joined by Nick Johnson, co Yeah, I think it was about 2006, mid 2000s. And the rumor was for under $20 million. Right. It-, it was 10 to 20. Uh, the number was never officially confirmed because it was under NDA, basically, but it was not a lot of money in the context. Of- it was acquired for a very small amount of money. Then for many, many years, it was operated underneath Condé Nast. And apparently, it's just. A lot of it was stifled, you know, the CEO and, and the, the founders left, uh, Alexis and so on. And um, it just wasn't doing, doing very well. Eventually, it was spun out underneath Advanced Media, I think, Publications, which is the holding company, which owns Conde Nast and a, and a few other kind of media entities. And when it was spun out underneath Advance, it was given a lot more autonomy. It was given more capital. It was given a lot more room to breathe. They were able to bring in a new CEO and and an additional uh, or different management. Right. And there was a series of other things that then that team was able to employ uh, in their strategy to make the platform successful. So it wasn't that the platform was non-existent while it was under Kone Nas, but the team wanted to be able to take a lot more risks to do a lot of different activities. Uh, to approach growth. They, they also had the problem where they were competing with the core business for resources. And what you ended up happening is the Reddit business basically got starved of money to the point where I think at one point they basically begged their users to give them money because they didn't have enough to like continue to hire developers and that kind of stuff. So they were like similar to what Wikipedia does. where like, please donate to us so we can continue to operate mm-hmm. Reddit. Once it got separated out from the core business and put under this advanced media publications piece, uh, it started to get the resources it needed to actually invest in and grow the business. It wasn't being treated like uh, you know, a, a mature business unit that needs to be profitable and gets judged by the same metrics as a lot of their magazines did. Right. And Condé Nast was basically just taking all of the L in the P&L from Reddit. And so that, right. that didn't make the executives happy about having all of these losses for this thing called Reddit because it wasn't right. making any money. Now, fast forward to today. Uh, or fast forward to last May of 2018, and it was announced that Reddit surpasses Facebook to become the third most visited website in the United States. Now, just to note, this is websites, so this isn't necessarily you know a top digital destination between uh, web and mobile and the whole thing, but top three websites in the United States. I think desktop websites, actually, to be clear. Anyway, right. it's a it's an incredible feat to beat Facebook.com. And so Reddit's clearly doing very well today. I think the most recent valuation, at least that I could find, again, advance is, is private and, and it's not necessarily public. Um, it was about a $2 billion valuation, but that could be grossly understated just if they're the number three uh, place. And, um, right, and they're starting to actually build a real advertising business yes, with that. Exactly. So that, that's going from... Uh, you know, a growth business to one that actually makes real revenue now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's become a part of their story yep. over the last 12 months. Yep. So it's a really great story of these tra- of a traditional linear enterprise in Conde Nast and ultimately advanced media buying a platform business, messing it up for the first number of years, stifling it, and then giving it more autonomy, giving it more space to grow. And then that actually being extremely successful. Um, and now if you think about, to your point, the ability to attract advertisers because of the platform in Reddit and then how the advertising dollars going into Reddit. Now these advertisers, you can also cross sell 
the slots for the Condé Nast, the traditional media publication inventory, which if we've looked at just about every other traditional media company that's trying to build its own advertising ecosystem, they're pretty much all failing right. because they don't have enough interesting or unique inventory just purely generated from the linear media you need, and content. You need that user generated content. Uh, Verizon has tried to do this. AT&T is taking a shot at it. Uh, and there's a number of others in the past that basically say, let's get all this linear content together and that should give us enough scale to compete with Google, Facebook, and so on. But it doesn't because you need that user-generated content. You need that network uh, to actually compete with them. They kind of just see Google and Facebook are big, so let's go make some acquisitions. Uh, and that's really not getting into the fundamentals of why Google and Facebook are big. Moving on to uh, Forever 21. Forever 21 has finally announced bankruptcy officially uh, yesterday evening. Um, this is our video from a couple weeks ago. Um, where we spoke about how it looked like Forever 21 was headed for bankruptcy at that point. And we love the comments from our, from our audience. So, so uh, Ahmed was saying how they never treated their workers well and they were giving them all a hard time. Um, and so, yep, that certainly is not going to help you, Forever 21. Probably came about, though, because they're hemorrhaging money all over the place. They had over 800 stores. So basically, they, I think, were the seventh largest um, tenant in Simon. Simon is, I'm pretty sure, the largest mall company yeah, in the United States. Big. And Forever 21 was the seventh largest tenant for Simon. So this is this is going to have ripple effects into a lot of different businesses, right. and that, the just ones, separate from the debtors. And the ones that are above them are like, you know, the Macy's and these anchor companies that are everywhere. So that's going to have a... Definitely going to have ripple effects. I think it's mostly a lot of the stores that are closing are international before U.S., but I'm sure there'll be some U.S. stores that get closed down or renegotiated in terms of the lease yep. uh, to not be favorable and kind of just pile on some of the pain that malls yep. have been having. So basically, I mean, what 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 the key thing that Forever 21 is trying to get from bankruptcy is the judge to approve them to close nearly 200 locations. And the reason why they just can't turn around and close these things is because they've signed long-term leases, leases right. with malls like Simon and Simon's not going to let them out of a lease. So then they say, okay, well I've got to declare bankruptcy, right? They haven't, I think they didn't pay their leases uh, last month. So basically they're saying, well, we're not going to pay you and we're bankrupt. So come to the negotiating table and give us a deal. Right. You've got to let you me out to of get these money. leases. I just, I can't operate the business. The, you know, I, I'm just too underwater on too many of these stores right. for the business to continue. Um, so, you know, bankruptcy is a strategy and you're just going to see a lot of retailers have to uh, deploy that strategy um, for the coming weeks and months. So um, another throwback, last throwback here is about McDonald's. We just spoke about McDonald's on the last episode of Winner Take All, missing a big opportunity in China. Here, I'm going to play that little snippet for you. So they sold an 80% stake. For two billion dollars in 2017, January 2017. So you know, a little, about like two and a half years ago, Maituan has raised eight billion dollars. Yeah. Okay. Raised eight billion dollars. Now, food food delivery in China is a massive market. You it's have a, a lot of these deal. very dense Valued urban at cities. Fifty five billion dollars to IPO. This was uh, this was a year ago. So who knows? Whatever it is. Do the comparison, right? $3 billion, $50 billion. <laughs> A lot of enterprise value there. Which one do you want to capture, right? It was there. They could have done it. They could have done it. Okay, so in, in other episodes, which I won't replay at this moment, we've also spoken about how McDonald's had a big miss on Uber Eats. And then they just gave way too, too good of a sweetheart deal to Uber Eats. There's an article that came out, I think, let's see, end of last week. Yep. Maybe this was Friday. In Bloomberg, talking about Steve Easterbrook, CEO of McDonald's, and what he had to do to get McDonald's to play catch up uh, with delivery. And they're basically talking about how you know, Burger King and their competitors were beating them in delivery. Yeah, so the, the story here, 
which this article goes into, and it, this is spinning it ultimately as a positive saying and, uh, McDonald's is making progress, is basically when Easterbrook came in as the CEO, McDonald's was way behind on delivery. The example they give is he was mad going into a meeting because it was uh, the Classico, which is the big Barcelona Real Madrid game. Or I think it was they, every night that Barcelona or Real Madrid prayed in Spain, their same, st- same store sales would tank because they didn't have delivery. Burger King did. And people weren't going out because they were watching these soccer games or football games if you're in Europe. And they were ordering Burger King basically instead of going to McDonald's. And they had to get this. And he's like, we need, within a matter of weeks and months, we need to figure this out at scale, uh, which I think is ultimately a big part of what then pushed them into this Uber Eats deal because they felt we're so far behind, we can't go build this ourselves because if we were going to do that, we should have been doing this for years. And he came in and basically said, let's do this. Let's go partner with Uber Eats, which is part of where that deal came out of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically, I mean, look, it, the CEO said, we've got to do this. We've got to move fast. We're not going to take six months to run a trial in a few cities and out see own, how it goes. Right? And then, oh, okay. And then we'll roll it out. He said, nope, we're rolling this out everywhere in two weeks. And let's go. Yep. Um, which, which was the right decision. Given where they were at in 2015. Yeah. Given where they're at. I think our criticism of it is, why did it continue? For so long with this with Uber Eats this way, right? And they're actually saying in this article in Uber's um private filing documents, not not in the S1, but private prospectus when they were going public, they had two pages in the prospectus dedicated to the relationship, the contract that they had with with McDonald's for exclusivity. Right. So I mean, clearly, clearly Uber Eats and Uber thought it was a pretty good deal. <laughs> it was an amazing deal. And it, yeah, and as we've spoken about, it let Uber build, Uber was able to build Uber Eats on the back of McDonald's. Full stop. Yeah. Because McDonald's was so slow. But was McDonald's so, I mean, they were working with Uber Eats for years. Um, they yeah. went public in 2019. I think this was I 2015 least, or least 2016. Three, two, when did all years. this start? Yeah. yeah. It's been years they've been doing this. They could have revisited this in the past two or, you know, past two years um, and tried to do something differently or understand how much leverage they still had right. with Uber. But Ad, they keyword had not anymore. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that was the clip that, that I wanted to show you from the last episode. We were talking about Uber missing basically a $50 billion opportunity to own the platform in China. Um, and say, I mean, it's time. McDonald's missed it in China. McDonald's missing it yeah. in China. Yeah. To say there's that the, they could have been the the food delivery, dominant food delivery platform of China. Right. Because they actually, in China, uh, McDonald's China, something of a separate company, they have a JV with a Chinese company, basically. And they were doing delivery in China for quite a long time. Right. And could have gone and basically, as we talked about last Who's episode, spin out their own platform in China. Didn't and now they're dependent on all these other platforms yep. for a lot of the business. And but the unfortunate thing is whether they are whether they are looking at doing their own platform or partnering, you know, or doing a deal with a platform, we just see these large traditional enterprises continue to um, miss the leverage or the value that they have relative yep. to the platform business, and they mess it up. They they squander value, um, which is unfortunate. It's good for the platform. It's bad for the investors. Good good for McDonald's in the short term. It's helped their sales a lot. If you look at where they're growing and how they've turned around under uh, Easterbrook's direction, they've done sales have gone up and they've rebounded a little bit. But that's a short term boost. Long term, it's a weak strategic position to be in. Yes. All right. Um, So we wanted to do a little analysis here. We wanted to compare. We've talked a lot about how these large tech monopolies, the way the reason they've been able to outperform for the past 10, 12 years is because they're massive new business incubation engines. You should make an acronym out of that. Um, they just continue to spin out new platform businesses on top of the core monopoly business. And um, that is what's setting themselves up for to outperform in the next 10 years. And um, we're going to take an assessment of where we see the big three, the big three being Apple, Amazon, and Google. 
um, and see kind of we're going to we're going to vote Nick and I. And we're going to kind of analyze and kind of break down for you what we see is their different assets. So if we look at Apple here, so there's four quadrants. Top left is monopoly quadrant. Um, top right is critical mass quadrant. Bottom right. I mean, uh, yeah, bottom right is rising star quadrant. Bottom left is limbo quadrant. So think about this as going from limbo to rising star to critical mass to monopoly. Um, and you can basically see this is for Apple. My don't blame me for my handwriting. I know it's not very good, um, but you're going to get the idea. OK, so limbo. What are past platform initiatives that Apple has tried? They've killed off like the Apple car where they're trying to do a kind of their own operating system embedded in a car or new platforms that they've come out with. But, you know, we haven't really seen some strong, strong traction one way or the other, like their augmented reality development kit. Um, Rising Star, what are new up and coming initiatives that seem to have good traction? They haven't really solidified that network effect yet, but seem to be trending on an upward trajectory. The things that we have in here would be CarPlay, um, Apple Health, right, which is tied to the Apple Watch and sharing your uh, personal health records we've spoken about now, where they're doing deals with EHR companies like Allscripts and other places to try and get your health records into Apple Health. Um, Apple ID. So this is the single sign-on, right, where I can now store all my passwords for these other apps um, and sign into apps via Apple ID. And it's kind of this pseudo development platform that's letting me log into all these apps. I would say that dovetails pretty closely, too, with Apple Pay, which today isn't really a true platform. Basically, they're just creating a distribution mechanism on top of the rails of the credit card companies. Yeah. But if you start to get to Apple ID, where they basically control the login and then, of course, can use that to facilitate payment, then you might start to get to uh, something of a more actual true payment platform rather than basically a you know, customer acquisition and distribution business. Mm -hmm. Great point. Apple Watch. Yep. There's there's <coughs> Apple Watch specific apps uh, that are that are built just for that device. iMessage, a kind of messaging communication platform just amongst iPhone users. I'd say those are both pretty strong doing pretty well, definitely have strong lock-in. Um, I know a lot of users that just anecdotally, um, you know, uh, messaging with Android users versus uh, messaging with other people on iPhones. There's definitely a, um, you know, there's, some there's good lock-in there. A stigma to the green text uh, yeah. with certain people if you're on Android. <laughs> um, monopolies, right? What's, what's the main monopoly of Apple? It's the same one they've had for the past 10 years. It's basically iOS on running on the phone or the iPad and then the app store somewhat similarly for the, for the Mac with an app store, but certainly the dominant monopoly platform for them is this uh, controlled development platform in our lingo. It's worth probably explaining too. We don't have iTunes in here. iTunes itself, not really a platform that's similar to Spotify. Basically they have a lot of these licensing deals with big companies that they can go and sell uh, their music much more consolidated. Uh, so there's not really a network effect there to the same yeah, degree. There's five providers of all the movies or right. all the music or right. all the content. It's not. Yes, exactly. And there's no deal, real network they have effect. deals with each of these big labels yes. basically to go do it. So there's not really it's uh, not really a platform business. That's a good point. What are the other linear things? Right. There's Apple TV, Apple TV or Apple, Apple music plus Apple music. Yeah. Um, they bought beats. Um, well, that really transition into Apple Music, but they also have the headphones. And they have the headphones, they right? Yeah. These are all linear either services or linear products. They're not platforms. Right. They're kind of bolt-on services, um, even the iCloud service, yep. right? Storage. A, a lot of what service. Apple calls services revenue. There's iOS and the App Store, which is most of it, but yep. basically everything they're trying to build on top of that is pretty much all linear. They have they're a not goal. really building out many more platforms. I think by 2021, they want to get to $50 billion in services, services revenue. Right. I think they're, what, around 30 or $35 billion right, right now. Right, which I think at least two-thirds of that being the App Store. Oh, at least, dish. yeah, exactly. Large, large majority is that 30% cut that Apple takes from when you, when you spend money on an app. That's an, what we're talking about purchase. as yeah. the um, revenue from the App Store. Um, being the, 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 the large component of it. And that's the ultra high margin revenue within the services. This other stuff is 
pretty high margin as well, but it's never going to be as high margin as the 30% take rate that Apple gets on, on all that digital spend. So, you know, if I was to rank Apple on a scale of one to 10 in terms of how exciting are these rising star platforms, right? How much do I see these critical mass platforms kind of moving into their next monopoly phases? I'd honestly give them maybe like a six. I think you're being too nice. I'd give them about a four. Okay. I think they're, I think let's, the, let's give them a five. I'll average it out to a five. I think the one that has the most potential is Apple health. I think if the ones, if you have the other ones, I struggle to see how they actually monetize those yes. in a way that makes a huge impact on their business, which is what they're going to need to make up for basically mature and declining yeah. iPhone sales. Uh, and you know, China supply chain struggles and struggling in the Chinese market. Yeah. Apple watch, I think is we've seen is strong, but it's not going to make up the difference. And if I look in the rising stars, the only one that's there that I think would make that up is Apple Health. And I think obviously healthcare is a huge market, not just in the U.S., but internationally. Uh, and if they can get traction there, that could be uh, you know a, a future monopoly for them. The others, I think, are uh, interesting, but not going to get to quite that scale. You know what I didn't put in here is Apple TV, um, which I, you know, I'd say, I don't know, where'd you put that? I, I would... Apple TV would definitely put in limbo as it stands currently. It doesn't have much traction. I think another one that would go there would be HomeKit. Mm-hmm. Basically their home IoT thing. They have this you know, base station kind of thing that you can use uh, to hook up other devices to it, but I don't think it's gotten a terrible amount of traction. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think to your point, these platforms are basically dependent on the, on the core monopoly. They're all, they're all built around the iPhone. Right. And I don't think many they of them have a strong standalone. Right. Many of them don't have a strong use case. They don't have their own monetization. Unless model. you have an iPhone. And right, they're not making a lot they're of money. They're really just that. for lock in to keep you on the iPhone. The iPhone. Yeah. Right. But what Apple needs is its own independent, separate platform businesses that can stand up that five to ten year future for them. And I, I just don't see it. Ma- That's Ma- why Mac this OS Apple is card another to one that was, would go on here. Mac OS I've got up here. Um oh, okay. But, I didn't see that. But yeah, I'd say Apple TV. It's somewhere between Limbo and Rising Star. I think they're selling millions of units, but yeah, are they really building out a lot of specific third-party kind of software developer ecosystem? And it makes money that make that you can monetize. And I don't think we're really seeing that. And they're kind of stuck between an Xbox and a a PlayStation versus what Google and Amazon are getting to, which which we'll get to in a second with Google Home and 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 the Amazon Alexa. So let's look at Google. Google's tried a bunch of things in the limbo zone that are dead. If you remember uh, Google Plus and Orkut, when they've tried to do social networking a million times. RIP. Um, Weave, which was kind of like a collaboration messaging platform thing, Slack-ish. Was that Wave? Wave. Yeah, yes, Wave. Wave. There's also a Weave, which was maybe um, like the, the IoT protocol. I was getting those confused. Home services, they kind of like aqua hired the people from HomeJoy after HomeJoy right. went out of business. Google Glass, if you if you spent a thousand or something dollars like I did, um, it was a fun gimmick, but it's dead. Um, shopping is the thing that's still going. It's been around. It's gone through many iterations. I'm sorry. They're getting sued over it. I wouldn't say it's very successful, though. What I think Google has done a very good job in doing is... Seeding things internally, which fail, and then buying companies and scaling them, which is still a mechanism of being a new business incubation engine. It just means that the new business is a little bit bigger <laughs> when you take it over, but you're still yeah, incubating a, this thing. A little thing, more costly, too. And a little bit more costly, which right. their multiples can pay for. So where have they done that? Um, let's look at the monopoly bucket here. So search, that was homegrown. That's the big money maker. YouTube. So if you remember, they started Google Video. Google Video was running, but Google Video was moving slower because Google didn't want, was putting more protections around IP and infringing content. YouTube was wild, wild west and said, hey, just put any video up on YouTube. I'm a startup. I don't care about getting sued. No one's going to sue me because I'm not Google. I don't have a bunch of money. So Google Video was growing very fast, but slower than YouTube. Google saw what was going on. Buy YouTube for a billion dollars. Everyone said they were crazy. Right. They thought everyone was going to sue YouTube into the ground and Google by extension. And, and YouTube, not quite how it played out. YouTube is crushing it. Um, Android, same thing. Much smaller acquisition. They bought it for about $50 million. Right. 
And then we're able to put together this consortium, the Open Handset Alliance. They bought it in about 2005 or 2006 too, well before you know, the iPhone and the stuff came out. So it wasn't reactive. They had been working on this for a while. Yeah, but Eric Schmidt was on the board of Apple and saw what was going Hopefully, on. But yes. yes. Um, <laughs> and then Steve Jobs pledged to to pummel Google into the ground. Um, but uh, but yes, they they bought it for, 20, I think, 2005, worked on it for three years at least, put a bunch of resources into it. And then was able to get the handset manufacturers and the telecoms and everyone lined up yep. and then build the developer ecosystem. Huge success. What's coming behind that? I'd say, you know, Google Docs has been very successful um, and is, is a viable competitor to the Microsoft Office suite. Yeah. And then the rising stars. So this is what's really exciting for me. I'm probably most excited about Android Automotive, which is different than... Um, Android Auto, which I, I could put in here, but I didn't. Um, Android Automotive is, we've spoken about this as an operating system in the vehicle, which they've inked deals now with Honda and GM two weeks ago. I think maybe Volvo as well. There was one other one yep, in there. Yeah, the Volvo. I don't know. A GM, horrible decision. Um, Android Automotive, I think that's going to be a big win. I'm very bullish on the connected vehicle being the next huge development platform opportunity right. also why it's very disheartening to see apple giving up on apple car um given the opportunity that we see there i think apple probably just have to end up buying tesla well, i think the the problem for apple is their whole approach is integrated hardware and yes. software and that's harder to do in a car than just own the software component which google says you know we'll work with the oems exactly. and so the the apple approach to things is not necessarily going to work as well in a car because they've done a great job with, you know, first laptops and then, mm -hmm. and then smartphones. Yep. It just works. Car is a, is a very different beast to get yep. into that supply chain. Right. Which, Elon's going to get some volume up and then they'll buy it and maybe he'll become <laughs> CEO of Apple, which I think he'd be interested in because then he'll definitely get to Mars. But um, anyway, Android Automotive is very exciting. Google Home is very exciting. They're definitely top in the top two with Amazon in the lead with the yep. Alexas. Um, also very disheartening that Apple missed this. Um, given that they've already were in the home with TV and all these things. So um, I'd probably put Google and again, what's not in here. So what's not in here. Well, that's it, a linear service from Google. Uh, I think we're missing uh, verily in Google health and the stuff they're doing there. I'd say that it's as a platform. I would add that on rising star. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm, I think it's sure. still, it's probably earlier on than some of these other things, but uh, the potential again, healthcare is massive and they've gotten some big partnerships uh, with some of the big pharma companies, for example, uh, that they announced uh, earlier this year. So that's definitely got some momentum behind it. Mm -hmm. But uh, what what linear things from a from Google are There's not a, on here? Gmail. Yes, exactly. Um, I think Waze is probably also one that I would put on critical mass. I put like Google Maps on here. Yeah. You know, some of the key killer apps. They well, Waze is definitely a platform. So I would add mm -hmm. that. Um, Google Maps less so. It's more about. Uh, automated kind of sucking data in, yep. whereas Waze has much more of a user generated component. Yep. So Waze and 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 Verily we could add in. Verily, you know, yeah, it's a subsidiary. Um, but but very very separate from Google. So I would I would probably put Google at about, I don't know, an eight out of ten in terms of I think where these things could go for them and how how big that could be for them in the future. I would give them, them, I would give them about a seven for execution and probably like a nine for potential. So I feel like eight's probably a good place to put them. I think that they're in all the spaces that are going to be really big in the next five to 10 years mm -hmm. uh, and have really strong initiatives, health, auto, home. Uh, whereas I think Apple is falling down a lot on basically all of those maybe except health. Yep. Uh, and, but I think they've got a lot of these things that they've missed in the past. Uh, and not done very well on. So I think that you know, execution wise, I think Android was great. Uh, but I think that's probably, you know, YouTube has done really well for them, but they've, they've missed on some of these things that they've gone after. Okay. So last one, Amazon, let's look at the stuff that's failed, right? Fire phone, Amazon auctions way, 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 way back in the day. Amazon Askville, which is like a Quora um, Q and a site that they tried and killed. Amazon Fresh and Whole Foods kind of in limbo in terms of how that's all working out for them. Um, I think they moved it linear. It used to let yep. third-party suppliers Fresh in. Had, but yeah, Fresh had third-party suppliers. Struggled for a bit with the logistics in particular of like, how do you deliver fresh foods from third-party sellers? And then eventually went linear. 
hasn't quite made, I think, the impact yet with uh, Whole Foods and Fresh that they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, B2C product, that's the Amazon marketplace that you know and love. And just over the past 25 years, they've been going from one vertical to another. So there's still a lot of growth in that, as we've seen with advertising. That's right. an interesting note. Why is advertising not on any of these charts? Because it's not its own independent platform model. Right. You know, I think people get confused about an ad network as being its own platform model. The ad, just think about the ad network and then advertiser ecosystem as a as a third stakeholder, you're basically just selling inventory, imaginary inventory that you can just make on the up platform. Right. On the platform, right? But unless you had that core transaction of of that, um, basically, um, in many times a, a a value creator for Amazon, it's selling products for Google, it's a website or a video, um, and then the consumer. But without that core transaction, advertisers not interested in anything. So that's not a, that's why it's it's a monetization model of these different platform businesses b2c product you're all familiar with that aws they have third-party developers they are the leader in aws with google um cloud behind that missed that one on google too actually yeah i gotta go fix some of these a little bit um kindle the interesting thing with kindle is yes there are some big publishing publishers but um the uh the kindle um has its own self-publishing model. Right. That you can really democratize, democratize publishing. You know, this is something we saw around the time we were looking at writing a book and figuring out, you know, what is, how does publishing work? What are the other options? Kindle has done a really good job at basically opening that up to anyone. And obviously there's, there's you know, a hit driven dynamic to that. So not everyone who publishes on Kindle is going to do well, but there are a lot of authors that publish on Kindle and are really good at you know, promoting themselves and cultivating an audience and are then able to be hugely successful just operating through Kindle. Mm -hmm. So they've really done a good job of uh, building their own stars and and kind of organic, unique content, uh, which is something you need for a, pl a content platform to be successful. Yep. So, so the two dominant kind of critical mass ones are Twitch and the Alexa in the home, um, which are very promising. Uh, also have their own standalone monetization models are building out their own producer bases with content creators for Twitch and people building skills. There's hundreds of thousands, if not maybe millions of skills that have now been created on Alexa voice activated right. skills. And look at the rising star bucket. I mean, this by far is the most aggressive uh, bucket that we have. Amazon business, we've spoken about extensively with B2B distribution, Amazon flex in the logistics space and now going up against UPS and FedEx and letting all of these third party uh, either truckers or uh, fulfillment providers um, be third party service providers on this logistics marketplace. Home services they've gotten into. Um, they've done deals with Lennar, the largest uh, construction and home builder in the United States to put Alexas and connected services in the home and then be able to backfill um, home services. They bought Ring. Right. Um, so you can get stuff delivered into your house. Get stuff delivered. Kind of stuff. Control the you know the the actual door into the house. They have Amazon Pay, um, and coupled with that, Amazon Go. Yep. Um, Which is the automated checkout, basically technology that's behind this Amazon Go stores, but the technology itself could become its own platform business. Mm -hmm. I would give them a nine. The only thing that I would want them to be more aggressive in that that I, that they're not is the car. Given my obsession with the car, they are doing some stuff in the car, like delivery to trunk and that kind of stuff. delivery to trunk yeah. and and voice activated, you know, Alexa stuff in the vehicle and things like that. But um, I'd say, you know, there is a play for them to 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 <coughs> definitely be farther along in the car than they are. But that said, I'd say out of the three. I definitely think Amazon long term is in the best position for these huge growth initiatives to start to move into critical mass or what is in critical mass to move into monopoly status. Right. They're also, drive they're also in healthcare returns. with PillPack, which is linear, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's an area where I'd expect uh, to see some platform movement as they get further and further into healthcare. Uh, they do serve the healthcare sector via Amazon business, basically selling medical supplies, dental supplies, and that kind of stuff to 
hospitals, doctors, dentists, and so on. So they're they're Which active is massive in healthcare, B two B distribution, as we've talked about on this program many times. Huge, massive industry. Amazon has had a lot of success in just a few years with uh, Amazon business, and that's a massive, massive opportunity. Could be as big or bigger than their B two C marketplace. Uh, you know, within the next five to ten years. Yep, exactly. So that was it for us today on Winner Take All. If you like some of these these graphs and these analyses, uh, let us know, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us.